Hello and welcome to The Old Flies. The Vietnam War, 1955 to 1975, between North and South Vietnam, was considered a Cold War proxy conflict. The United States and some of its allies, including Australia, supported the South, whereas China and the Soviet Union supported the North. Australia became involved in 1962, not through an invitation from the South Vietnamese government, but from the Australian Embassy in Saigon. Conscription based on a birth date was used to quickly raise up to 60,000 ground troops, air force and navy personnel. If you were my age and an Australian male, then you could be called up. Some went willingly, some burnt their draft notices. This was a divisive war both here and in America. The war was the cause of the greatest social and political dissent in Australia since the conscription referendums of the First World War. Many draft resistors, conscientious objectors and protesters were fined or jailed while soldiers met a hostile reception on their return home. In July 1966, RAAF fighter pilots began serving as airborne forward air controllers flying US Air Force aircraft supporting Allied ground forces by directing strike aircraft against enemy targets on the ground. A third RAAF squadron of Canberra jet bombers was also committed in 1967. It was in August 1966 that 108 Australian soldiers faced an enemy force estimated at over 2,000 in a rubber plantation at Long Tan, considered to be an action equivalent to the Anzacs storming Gallipoli in 1915. I recommend Peter Fitzsimon's book The Battle of Long Tan if you want to get into the skin of the Australian trooper. Here are some Australian returned soldiers speaking of their experience of the Battle of Long Tan. So I did command uh, Delta Company 6 RAO at the Battle of Long Tan. Um, the thing that sticks in my mind 52 years later is the uh, the courage and gallantry uh, of my soldiers. They were the ones that eyeballed the enemy and uh, I was just further back uh, giving orders, shall we say. And um, uh, I was very sad <laughs> to um, lose 17 soldiers killed that day. I said, oh, what am I going to do now? <laughs> But no, you're trained to do a certain job and sergeants are trained to take over from the platoon command that happens. I knew what I had to do. I just had to change from being a platoon sergeant to being a commander and making sure that I did what I needed to be done. Yeah, well, I went over 29 soldiers and there's only eight of us left the next morning. My first reaction when my skipper, my captain of the helicopter said, we'll do it. We walked outside and I said, what the hell are you doing? This is suicide. Um, how the hell did we fly out there full of ammunition, no support, uh, and there's thousands of VC out there. We were in pouring rain and I was looking down between my feet to see the ground because we couldn't see out the front at all or out the side. And um, <coughs> I recognised a, a landmark and we were behind the enemy line. But the whole time we were there, you never, I never thought we were going to come back. Eventually, the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese Army ousted the Allies. The predicted sweep of communism throughout the region, known as the domino theory, never happened. The neighbouring country of Laos is a democratic republic and Cambodia, Thailand and Malaysia are all constitutional monarchies. A rationale for Australia's involvement was to prevent communism marching south towards Australia. How odd that we lost the war, yet that expected outcome didn't come to pass. I want to relate one story that reveals the mental trauma experienced by ex-servicemen and women of this unpopular war. An Australian Huey pilot was speaking to the All Flyers group about his service in Vietnam. Whenever flying, he was anxious and alert to danger. Indeed, 
He sat on a Volkswagen hubcap to protect his family jewels from gunfire from below. He was talking about conducting a dust-off to extract wounded soldiers when one in our audience broke into uncontrollable sobbing. Everyone stopped to allow this chap to recover. He explained that this brought back bad memories of the time when he was injured in Vietnam and was saved by a brave Huey pilot. Here is one Huey pilot talking about a particularly bad day in Vietnam when he was called in to evacuate a soldier hit in the back by a rocket grenade. Here was the area which we were asked to go into with reference 262907. This was part of Operation Goodwood, which 9 Royal Australian Regiment was involved in on the 1st to the 16th of February 1969. It was their first major operation since arriving in country. The general area of operations for 9 Rata were to pursue along this blue line with company patrols seeking out to destroy the enemy and their bunker systems. The vivid recollection of, of that afternoon is in, in, in the introductory part was I was coming back out of, out of the pad at Wakefield, flying back to Nui Dat without a care in the world. It was a lovely afternoon, balmy, dry season, beautiful. <laughs> And I was thinking what the boys were doing back in Sydney, probably in the pub, having a few beers. And then all of a sudden we got this damn call. Anyway, proceed to grid reference 262907, which is here. D Company 9 Ra had run into a bunker system and been ambushed. Bunkers were like honeycomb, uh, the rabbit warrens, uh, all throughout this area. And this is what they looked like. This is a, a bunker in the hat ditch area. See one of our diggers ready to... Uh, punch a hole in anything that pops out. And what had happened was the radio operator of the patrol, or the platoon, had been hit in the back by a rocket propelled grenade, which is an anti-tank weapon. There is a nasty little missile, and here's a picture of a radio man with his PRC-25 on his back, and uh, the point man calling his uh, patrol leader back with some observation. But the radio man typically had this PRC-25 uh, PRC on his back, he was a backpack, and there's a picture of the radio set. Not too much to keep you from harm when you're hit by an anti-tank grenade. The jungle, it was tertiary, secondary and primary. Tertiary, secondary and primary. The tops, the crowns of the tops, over 200 feet. While we were en route to this grid reference, I was thinking, well, the last bloke that was there got shot down. What am I going to do to avoid it? Determined that our best chance was to be able to hover in the crown of a tree and hope that it would enable the cable to penetrate down to the ground. We did not have a jungle penetrator, I wish we did. But there was 200 feet for that cable to drop and it could have got caught up anywhere, which meant time. Going into it, I managed to find the nice crown of a, of a tree that was close to the smoke that they'd popped and settled the helicopter into it. And I was hovering with my reference, hover reference was a branch just about there. The helicopter rotor was whirring around above it all. So I was nicely settled in, this, in, this, in the top of this tree, which gave us plenty of cover, well, I thought, from the tertiary and the secondary and then this crown of the tree. Here we're getting close. This is not the actual day. I was a bit busy to take photos that day. And this is where the diggers were. That's what it's like down the bottom there. A Huey in the winching position. See the winch operator here, the winch arm out the side and the cable there. And this bloke's sitting on what they call a jungle penetrator. Here's a jungle penetrator. The arms fold up so it penetrates the jungle and then the man can sit on it and be winched up. The trouble is this bloke had taken a grenade in the back. He was no, he was no sitting patient, he was a lying patient. So he needed a Stokes, Stokes litter. And thankfully the uh, Americans provided with that when they cable cut and flew off. So this is the Stokes litter and this is how he came up. This is how we brought him up, through the primary, secondary and tertiary jungle levels. 200 feet were about oh, just a shade under 10 minutes in the hover, I think. Now while the, we're, we're pulling this chap up, all hell is breaking loose on the ground. I was actually screaming over the radio to make myself heard. I had Rocky Del and my co-pilot, on the controls with me just in case one of us took it. The sound, the, the noise was just 
terrific. Um, uh, because the boys down on the ground were putting down very heavy covering fire so that they would protect us. The boys weren't going to move with this chap in the condition he was in. And what the Viet Cong tend to do in those circumstances, they know that we will bring in artillery, either airborne by fighters or Royal Australian Artillery 105mm cannon or 155mm cannon. So the Viet Cong tend to hug and the jungle is so thick that they can't hunt to within 20 metres and you won't see them. And that's too close to put in uh, any artillery fire. So the boys were keeping their heads down so they wouldn't ping us. Uh, it's the longest 10 or so minutes I've ever spent in my life. I know what fear is like. I mean, the taste of it is terrible. Anyway, we managed to get this fellow up to the, to the skids and onto the helicopter cargo floor. And uh, Jock York said, sir, he's dead. And I was pulling out and we were going to one AOS, ALSG, <laughs> Australian Logistics Support Group, here to one Australian Field Hospital. And I said, I don't care what you do, Jock, just get him, he had vital signs when he left the ground, get him going again. And the two boys in the back, to their credit, actually got him going again, got vital signs by the time we got to um, Vampire Pad. Meanwhile, Rocky and I had this old 380 wound up to about 137 knots, and we were just an approaching to retreating blade stall. She was nibbling. The red line speed of a Huey is 124. Any faster, and you start to run into a problem called retreating blade stall. Helicopters are like that. The faster you go, the more trouble you get into. So we had this old girl wound up to make our way back from a position up here to ALSG. By this time, we'd adopted the dust off call sign, and they gave us priority through the control traffic area into uh, the Bungtow Aerodrome Control Zone. There's a shot of the Australian Log Logistics Support Group at Bungtow, and as it so happens, there's Longson Island from where we got the rocket attack during my, uh, that uh, fateful breakfast before my captain checkout, the Nui Dins in the background, and here is number one Australian Field Hospital with Vampire Pad. Vampire Pad. Only doctors could be that cynical. <laughs> Okay, the Australian Field Hospital displaying its uh, Red Cross and Vampire Pad will be landed and shut down and the team was ready there to take our casualty straight into uh, the, uh, the hospital. We went back to fire support by Susan and shut down because we were told to in case there was any more to do but soon after they said no, you can go back to Kangaroo Pad. Kangaroo Pad is this pad here just south of Luscombe Field with Nui Dat, named after Hill Nui Dat, and the Australian task force surrounding it. And we sat there for sta on standby, wondering what nasty surprises they had for us next. Well, as luck would have it, they had none, they said we could go home. While we were at Vampire Pad, we shut down to have a look at the helicopter, because we, th we, were, we were sure we'd taken rounds. And we searched lo high and low, and we couldn't find a mark. I could hear them going by the window, and uh, it, it's, a, it's a horrible sound. Couldn't find a thing, so we started up and went back on standby. Well, I was in the bar that night having several cold ales to soothe the nerves. The squadron engineering officer came out and said, Noddy, you want to jump in my jeep? We'll go down and have a look at the helicopter you brought in. I said, oh, all right. It was Ron Tucker, squadron leader, lovely bloke. Anyway, down we went to the hangar, he said, have a look at that. And we'd scored a hit right in there, right in the blade group. And he said, um, thank God you didn't do too much more flying, mate. I said, why? He said, if we examine that, it's probably starting to crack already. You would have lost a blade. Now, when a helicopter's operating, there is 800 tonnes of tension across the rotor head. That's what keeps the blades flat. So we were bloody lucky. The outcome. The next day, on the 9th of February, I and my crew were most saddened to hear that just after 3 a.m. that morning, our casualty, Lance Corporal Malcolm McConaughey, 1201200 had succumbed to his massive injuries. Rest in peace, Malcolm. We did our best. Mankind has yet to devise a way to resolve conflict without resorting to violence. It is happening even now. The invasion of Ukraine by Russia, just one recent example of the use of force to gain territory and influence. Thank you for watching. To encourage new content, Please like and subscribe to support the channel.